Uh, I'm going to have you open your Bibles to, it's going to be Genesis 28, starting in verse 10. Uh, I'll read from that here in a moment, but I want to just intro what I'm going to be talking about today. So we've been in a series called Building the Hearth, and it's this concept and this idea of how do we cultivate, how do we steward the presence of God in our own lives? Uh, How many of you guys have been here for most of this series already? You've heard Pastor Sean, you've heard Dr. John, yeah, it's good. Um, We want to be a people here at the Rock of Roseville that actually cultivate a place in ourselves and in our community, um, to put it this way, that God likes to be, if I can say it that way. We want to organize our lives, we want to organize our internal world, uh, I'll get even practical here. We want to organize our schedules. We want to organize you know, our calendars even around being people that know how to meet with God and even know how to enjoy him when he shows up. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, about praying for revival consistently is I think most of us get so caught up in praying for revival, but I wonder how many of us would actually know what to do when God shows up. We get so caught in the process of like, yeah, one day God's going to show up. One day all this stuff is going to happen. And somewhere in there, we actually allow our hearts to slip away from faith. And we just get caught in the asking without realizing that at some point we left behind the belief that he's actually going to listen to us and show up when we ask because he's a good dad. Let you chew on that. Um, So we want to be these people who steward the presence of God. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today is actually something that we see the the patriarchs doing throughout the Old Testament. So for those of you who don't know what that term is, the patriarchs, when we talk about that in the context of the Old Testament, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some people might include Noah in that list. We will for today. But we're talking about these people that God met with, established covenant that ultimately became the nation of Israel, which led to the birth of Jesus, which, you know, that's why we're here today. There's this thing that the patriarchs do consistently through the Old Testament, where when God meets with them, you see that they set up an altar. So God meets with Noah. He builds the ark, he and his family, and all the animals that fit on this boat survive the flood, they exit, and then we see that Noah, one of the first things Noah does is he actually goes and he builds an altar, and then he worships God and sacrifices animals on that altar. You fast forward to Abram, or Abraham, depending on which part of the story that you're in, and God meets with him multiple times, and he keeps reiterating this promise to him. You know, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to lead you to a promised land. Your people are going to inhabit this. Kings are going to come from you, and all this stuff. And each time where the Lord meets with him, most of the times, I should say, where the Lord meets with him and speaks to him in this way, we see that he sets up an altar afterwards, and he worships the Lord He establishes this altar and then he moves on. And it's the same for Jacob, uh, which is going to be our text in Genesis 28, starting in verse 10. And I'm just going to read this through verse 22. And we're going to explore this passage a little bit. And it says, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. And he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky, and God's angels were going up and down on it. The Lord was standing there beside him, saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring." Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. You can underline that. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. 
This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named the place Bethel, though previously the city was named Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, if God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat, clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. The stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give to you a tenth of all that you give me. So one of my, one of my passions, one of my nerdy quirks, I guess you could say, is um, that I want to invite you all into is that the more that you read the Bible, you actually start to begin to see patterns and see themes and you get to begin to extract these things that God's communicating, not just through these singular passages and going really deep on one passage, but seeing broad things happen. So if we're seeing all of these people who were literally cornerstones of our faith, they, their obedience to God is the reason why we're here today. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we're seeing them go through this pattern of every time the Lord speaks to them, they set up an altar. That for me just kind of pings something in my brain and says like, let's look at this. Let's pay attention to it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And there's this principle that I want, I think God's inviting us into and I even want to, man, how do, I, how do I best communicate this? There we go. That's how I'll say it. Um, Sean, Amy, and Amanda and I recently just went on a retreat. So uh, we did that, and we were at a, a church service up in Reading. And in the middle of that service, uh, the Lord spoke something really clearly to me. And he said, Aaron, you want to build me a runway I'm asking you to build me a greenhouse. He said, Aaron, you want to build me a runway. I'm asking you to build me a greenhouse. So for those of you who are like, that's weird prophetic language, dude. I don't know what you're saying. Don't worry, I will interpret for you. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about stewarding the presence of God, we think about it in terms of a runway. We want to just create a space where we hope God will show up. He'll land the plane, he'll touch down, he'll offload whatever he needs to offload, but then he takes off again. And runways are awesome. We, we want to be people who create space for the Lord to touch down and crash in in whatever way he desires to, in whatever way he wants to. The issue is, is that if you're living off of stewarding the presence of the Lord in the sense of a runway, you're living off of the high of the last encounter. And growth only happens when he touches down. If you build a greenhouse, though, you're actually cultivating an atmosphere where growth happens and actually happens at an increased rate, regardless of what's going on outside of it. So when I'm looking at this topic, that's the, the framework that I'm looking at this topic under of altars. We want to be people who steward the presence of God and actually steward the, the times that God speaks, steward the times that he encounters us in such a way that we're not just going like, oh, that was a cool dream I had. Anyways, on to the next thing. But we're actually create, like taking those moments where God meets us and stewarding them in such a way that it creates an environment where growth happens. It creates an environment where other people can encounter the presence of God. Part of one of the things I want to look at is actually, as I said, to highlight it. Jacob's going through his life, and he's at this point, he's running away from his brother Esau while also going to try to find a wife. He's on his way to his, uh, his uncle, and he's like, hey, like, I need you to help me find somebody to get married to. And in the middle of all that craziness, he just picks, you know, what to him is any random rock, lays down and was like, I need to sleep because I need to get to where I'm going, but I need to rest. And then God shows up. He has this dream. He speaks to him. He gives him what he would have known was the, the promise that his father had gotten. So for him, it's like, okay, cool. God didn't pass me by. I'm, I'm the person who gets to actually continue the family legacy. 
But his response is really interesting. Surely God is in this place and I did not know it. Surely God is in this place and I did not know it. I would propose to us that God is regularly trying to speak to us and regularly wanting to meet with us, but we are ignorant of it. Cool concept, Aaron. I don't know if I believe you. Think about Moses for a second. Moses is on the backside of a desert. He's murdered somebody at this point. He's, you know, like trying to rebuild his life. And he's shepherding on this mountain. And then it says that he sees this bush burning, but that isn't consumed. It says he turned aside to go see it which means he had to make the choice intentionally to say, something's going on here. Let's look at it. There's another verse in Proverbs that says, it's the, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it's the glory of kings to seek it out. Do you know that God wants to be pursued? we oftentimes have this mentality that like, oh, if God wants to do something, he'll get my attention. Which there are times, trust me. You, you, you follow Jesus long enough, there will be times where you are living your day-to-day life and he just comes and it feels like he smacks you upside the head and is like, hey, listen, <laughs> need to talk to you about something. You're like, oh, okay. And there are times where he's actually inviting you into a level of relationship with him where it's the, the whispers, it's the small movements of his heart that cause you to actually turn, that cause you to make changes, causes you to make shifts. Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, if your relationship with your spouse, the communication only happens when you're shouting at each other, <laughs> something might be wrong there. So if we, if we live our lives in God with this framework of like, oh, if he needs to get my attention, he'll just start shouting at me. I mean, you're kind of leaving some stuff behind there. So something to think about. How many times is God actually trying to pull us in in our day-to-day lives and get our attention, but we're just somewhere else? And this is a daily thing for me. Like, I've got a four and a half year old and a two and a half year old. Lord knows my attention is oftentimes just being like, Jacob, get off of your brother. He doesn't want to wrestle right now. That's why he's screaming. Leave him alone. Don't jump off of that. Don't color on that. Stop trying to take your diaper off right now. What are you doing? And in, in the midst of all of that craziness, the, the presence of God is still there. So number one, hear, hear that. In the midst of your crazy life, whatever's going on, the presence of God is still there. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So that means in the midst of, and some of you need to hear this part, in the midst of you in your brokenness and your mess, even sinning in that place, having a sinful response, Lord knows, like, again, being a parent, there are times where kids pull stuff out of you that you didn't know was in there and you wish didn't come to the surface. Even in the middle of that, he's there. And he wants to talk to you. There are these moments where God wants to, to speak with us. And, and if we can actually cultivate a culture here at The Rock where we believe that, that's where transformation starts to take place. Do you recognize that like, if you can actually cultivate in your heart that when you are in the middle of your addiction, turning to the thing that you're struggling against, but you're going like you're just there, but you can actually even in that spot, learn to lean your heart into God's here and he actually loves me and he wants to speak to me in the middle of that, not, not before, not after, in the middle of it. That's where we can actually start to see transformation happen. 
we can cultivate that, if we can learn to lean in, slow down and lean in. <clears throat> Additionally, what can, we, what can we pull out of this, this practice of the patriarchs of setting up altars when God meets them and encounters them? I think that there's this principle here where uh, I think what God intends when he speaks to us is not that it would just stop with us. Come on, I think that when God speaks to us, he doesn't want it to just stop with us. That, think about it this way, that the kingdom is always given in seed form. So when the kingdom of God, like when Jesus comes, he speaks to you, there's actually in this tiny little seed that he's planting in you with the word that he gave you, and you can, you can even see it in, in the, the promise that he's giving Jacob. Nations are going to come from you. Kings are going to come from you. And he's looking around and he says, I'm actually not even married yet. So within that encounter, within that space where God speaks to him, there's actually this whole thing that God's about to unfold. I think oftentimes when, we, when God speaks and he encounters us, we often try to roll right into making it happen. We get a prophetic word and, and, and hear me like, I'm, I'm actually all for partnering with the word. Uh, Paul told Timothy, to wage the good warfare according to the prophetic word that was spoken over you when the, the presbytery of elders laid hands on you. There's something to not just receiving a word and just kind of going like, oh, I'll just kind of throw that on the shelf. And it's like, if God said that you're going to travel the nations, you can get a passport. Like, that's something practical that has to happen. I'm all for that. Um, I, I think there's something that gets missed, though, when we don't take in what he said and turn that into worship, which is what they're doing, right? Altars are places where sacrifices are burned and offered up to the Lord. They're actually, if you want to think about it this way, they're places of communion. Because, and I'm still like, uh, the, the nerd in me is still researching this, but sacrifices were viewed as meals that, that were offered to the Lord. It wasn't just, you know, like, oh, he said he wants a goat because I guess he likes goats for some reason, so let's give him a goat and let's burn that up there. Even in the context of covenant, like, you'll, you'll see this when God's making a covenant with Abraham. It, there's this kind of gruesome but intricate process of these animals that are getting split in half, they're getting sacrificed. It's, it's not just that a sacrifice is being made, it's that the, the, the practice of that day was that you would actually share a meal with the person who was making covenant with you. So God's giving these patriarchs these promises. He's saying, hey, this is what I'm going to do for you. This is what I'm, how I'm going to, this is what I'm going to make out of you. This is the promise I'm giving you. And they don't just immediately turn around and start saying like, okay, so let's, let's start planning out the, you know, the hierarchy. Let's plan out the kings. Let's try to get this thing going. They, the first thing they do is stop. They build an altar and from that place, they actually commune with the Lord. One of the things that you can view an altar as is not just a place where sacrifices are burned. Again, if it's this is where we share a meal with the one who's speaking to us, they're actually tables. So God gives a promise and they build a table. They commune with him over this thing. And that altar that gets set up, and this, this is where I'm going with this, so see if you can follow me here. That, that, that altar that gets set up is still there when they leave. So that means anybody who comes through that spot, they're walking through and they think just like Jake was like, oh, this is just any other spot. But now all of a sudden they see this altar wait, is God here? Can I meet with him here? Here. Like, I can actually access 
the Lord. And in different passages, the patriarchs are actually naming and renaming these places and these altars. So here's what I'm trying to say. The, the times that God speaks to you, the times that God encounters you, not only can they be places of communion where you can actually lean into the heart of God, see what the Father's actually like, but they can actually create atmospheres and bridges for other people to connect with God in the same way. Again, all this stuff is given in seed form, right? Part of my story, again, if you've been here for any length of time, you've probably heard me talk about it, but back in 2010, I encountered the Lord in a way that changed my life. I was, you know, grew up Southern Baptist, so for those of you who knows what that means, I wasn't just Baptist, I was like extra Baptist. <laughs> didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, I didn't fully buy into that line of reasoning, but you know, the, the power of God in terms of, you know, people getting healed, prophetic words being released, all of that was not something that we really believed in or did. So then I come to a winter camp here and it wasn't just like a dip your toe in the water. It was the Lord's like, how about I drop kick you into the middle of the ocean? <laughs> the, I just love telling the story, so you're going to hear it again. So whether you want to or not. The, the first chord, the first worship, like the first chord on the piano gets played. Nobody's preached yet, nobody's prayed yet, and I share those details to say, like, I, I'm aware that there are atmospheres where stuff kind of gets stirred up and people will play on your emotions and kind of do all that. Like, that's real. I'm not going to pretend that that's not. I share those details to say there wasn't a chance for any of that to even happen. This first chord gets played, 80% of the room gets laid flat because the presence of God shows up and for whatever reason, the way people's physical bodies reacted was just like, boom, down. And here's Southern Baptist Aaron. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? But in the middle of that, I, I get this vision, didn't know that that's what it was at the time of, a young dad holding his newborn son. And I hear so, internal audible is the way that I would describe it. It's like I'm not hearing it with my ears, but it's so loud inside of me that it's like this is very clearly not just me. Internally, internal audible, I hear, you're my son. I love you. There's nothing you could ever do to make me love you any more or love you any less. I was struggling with a porn addiction at the time. I was, had incredibly low self-esteem, all of this stuff. So I'm just, I, I'm basically this walking ball of shame, right? Uh, God doesn't want anything to do with me. I'm, I got saved by the skin of my teeth. I should just be happy that I'm even allowed in. Just all this stuff that, if we're honest, a bunch of us believe at different points in our lives, but we like to throw some Jesus glitter on it and just say like, no, nah, it's all good. God speaks in the middle of that, and this is what he says, and I'm, I'm a weeping mess, literally for four hours. Ugly cry not the whole thing. I can say definitively, I would not be here right now if that didn't happen. There were, in the pursuit of the God that I met in that moment, started to see things like the prophetic, started to see people get healed when I laid hands on them, started to actually, you know, like partner with the Lord, realize that he wants to work with me to help, like he wants me to work with him, I should say, to help build his kingdom to expand. And there, there are lives that have been touched by the goodness of God because of how that encounter was stewarded. So, again, this is, this is not necessarily a practical message about like, yeah, go home, do this, this, and this. But I want you to think about like, there, there are times that God has met you. There are times that he has spoken. There are dreams that you've had, prophetic words that have been given. 
And all of those things are actually meant to not just create a bridge for you to meet with God and have communion with him, but actually invite other people into that same thing. We are in a day and age very different from even just 10 years ago. Uh, there, there was a point in time where the best way to do evangelism was to learn apologetics because you were going to run up against people who read Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion and you had to be able to respond to arguments. And those are all still really good things to know, by the way. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Like, the, the Christian faith is actually very logical. Some of you need to hear that. Um, some of the best thinkers in the world have actually come from within the Christian tradition. And they've like gone through, they've reasoned, they've done all this stuff. Culturally in America, though, we're just not in that moment. People really, like you can give them all sorts of great arguments about why God's real, what he's like, all of that. And you can just spout all that off. They really don't care. But if you can tell them, I've met him and this is what he's like, they connect with that. If I can come to somebody on the street, or shoot, not even on the street, let's talk about the fact that like, we got to get stuff ironed out here too. Most of us think we know God and we get into this spot of like being bored with him because we think we've got him figured out. Hear this again. If you're bored in your Christianity, it's because you think you've got the infinite God figured out. <laughs> so somebody can come to me and say, Aaron, I'm dealing with all this shame and all this, and like I can, I can just try to throw Bible verses at them, which again, actually, like you need ammo. There are times where when you're learning how to fight the enemy in those moments, you need ammo, you need something you can stand on. So again, don't hear what I'm not saying. But there's something different that gets unlocked in the heart of people when I don't just say like, here's the answer for you and just like feel better now that I've given you the answer. When I can say, let me tell you about where I was and let me tell you how God met me. And that testimony that altar, if we're going to use that language for what we've been talking about today, creates a space where now they can actually commune with the Father. They're caught up in their shame, and they're used to people giving them just the like, yep, here's your fix-it verse. But when I say no, like, I've actually met the God who spoke to me in the middle of my shame. And this is what he said he felt about me. And in you doing that, you actually invite people into a reality in God that they might not have gotten to on their own. The encounters that you've had with the Lord, the prophetic words that he's given you, those invitations, those are all meant for you to actually take them, commune with the Lord over them. You turn them, again, to use the pictures from what we're talking about today, turn them into an altar, invite those people to that altar. Now, what if we had a whole congregation of people who knew how to do that? What if our conversations with each other were about how we stewarded the testimonies that God's given us? Oh, you don't know, like you, you got laid off and you don't know how your bills are going to get paid? Let me tell you about the time that I didn't know how I was going to make it happen, but there was a check in the mail the next day. You don't know how, I don't know how my marriage is going to make it. I don't know how, like, we're, we're fighting all the time. I don't feel like this is the same person that I got married to. Let me tell you about how God connected our hearts when we were ready to call it quits. I just got a cancer diagnosis. I... You know, like the doctors are saying it doesn't look good, it's stage four, all this stuff. Let me tell you about the God who met me in the same place. We start, when we do that with each other, we actually start to create an environment where the nature of God is regularly, we're putting it in front of each other. These encounters that we're having are being turned into worship. 
and it creates a greenhouse instead of just a runway. One more point I want to make, or one more thing I want to look at. If you continue with the story of Jacob, a um, couple of things. You'll, you'll notice that in the passage that we read, that it doesn't say he built an altar so much as he took a stone and set it up. But if, as you continue with his story, there's a point in time where God actually does all of the things that he told Jacob he would do. He's fed him, he's clothed him, he's got this family that's following him around, and God actually comes to him and says, hey, go back to Bethel and build an altar and settle there. A few things that I want to draw our attention to in that. Uh, the first is, even when you forget the encounters that you've had, God remembers them. That's something that's just been like warming my heart as I've been studying for this message is um, I, I, think, I think what happens in us internally when an encounter happens, when God meets us in a way that's dramatic and shifts things for us, we tend to view it in this way that's like, oh man, that's so important to me. It's so valuable. And, and you don't realize that for as much value as you place on it, God has infinitely more. God remembers the porn addicted, insecure Aaron back in 2010. And he, as much as I treasure that moment, the Lord actually holds it close enough that he can say, Aaron, do you remember who I am? That I met you the way that I did. He does the same thing for Jacob. Remember, I'm the God who met you there. It's time to go back. And I thought it was interesting, and I'll close with this, if the worship team wants to come up or somebody wants to be on the piano. Um, it was interesting that he at one point set up a pillar and then God tells him to go back and build an altar. I think that there's a maturing process that Jacob is going through here that's culminating, that, that's culminating in this building of an altar. I think that when we're young in the Lord, when we have a measure of immaturity, which, you know, we're all in different spots, I think we hear the word immaturity and we, like, attach shame to it. Like, growth is natural. Like, God's, God's not expecting you to be someplace that you have no reason to be yet. But along that growth path, like when we're young, these moments happen, we want to set up monuments to these moments that happen. Gosh, do you remember when? It would just be so awesome if something like that could just happen again. Like it would be awesome. We set up a monument. And it's this pillar that says like, this is this thing that happened this one time. I guess that was cool. But as we mature and Jacob moves from being a wanderer to being a father now, God tells him to set up an altar. Part of the maturing process that I believe the Lord wants to take us through is what I've been talking about, that you would take the encounters and the moments that he's given you and recognize there's actually something that God wants to commune with me over here. That this isn't just about a thing God did one time, but this is about the Father revealing himself to me in a way that I can, can actually give me strength, I can commune with him over, but I can actually invite other people to that table. Put it a different way. Babies will build monuments. Fathers will build altars. What if we were an altar building people?